My name is Christine Cha, and I'm an assistant professor in the Clinical Psychology Program at Teachers College, Columbia University, and the director of the Laboratory for Clinical and Developmental Studies. For the past decade, I've been studying questions around suicide and self-harm. Specifically, why do some people want to hurt themselves or want to die? Now, if you think about it, on the one hand, suicide seems completely paradoxical. When so much of what we assume about humans is that they survive, adapt, and thrive. And so from that perspective, it seems perplexing that someone would try to take their own life. On the other hand, if we for a moment take the perspective of a suicidal individual, it's that suicide may seem like a solution when so many other options have either been exhausted or seem impossible. So focusing on suicide, my lab studies suicidal thoughts and behaviors in a number of ways. First, we study thought patterns people have as they directly relate to death or suicide. For instance, we have found that suicidal individuals very closely pair the thought of death and the thought of themselves, and that the closer this pairing, or the stronger this what we call implicit association, the more likely it is that a person will try to kill themselves or have suicidal thoughts within six months of this thought pattern being detected. So it's possible to understand and study suicidal thoughts and behaviors through other thought patterns not directly having to do with death. More recently, my lab has focused on how suicidal individuals may imagine their future and whether they imagine it in a clear and vivid way or, as we suspect, in an overgeneralized and vague way. What we find consistent with the literature is that when suicidal individuals are asked to imagine their future, there's a notable lack of detail in their future event descriptions. They have greater difficulty thinking of details such as exactly where or when in time this future event might occur, or specific thoughts, emotions, or sensory experiences they might have if the event occurred. And if you think about this, uh, the difficulty in imagining the future can be concerning since, um, to a certain extent, future thinking can help us with problem solving, planning, and hoping our way out of our present situation. Um, another way of explaining it is through suicide theories by Roy O'Connor and Mark Williams uh, that say future thinking, and especially positive future thinking, help us perceive a sense of um, rescue from our present situation. And so this line of work sits at the intersection between cognitive psychology and clinical psychology and represents a promising a way for the two disciplines to collaborate with one another. Taking a more macro view, we know that suicide is a multi-determined outcome. And through the recent literature, including our own work, we're finding that it's in fact interactions between risk and protective factors that can be especially predictive. These can be interactions across biological vulnerabilities, environmental stressors, or psychological processes such as the thought patterns I described before. And what's really exciting is that we're entering a time where advances in statistics and data analytic approaches open up doors for us to observe interactions that are far more complex and likely more realistic than what we previously hypothesized. And finally, taking an even further step back, when my lab isn't looking at individual thought patterns or interactions across risk and protective factors, um, we're looking at the suicide literature as a whole, trying to take stock of what we as a research field have gotten right over the past 50 years and what are some uh, areas in need of attention and improvement. In doing so, we have found evidence for a pattern that we long suspected both through our own work and our colleagues' work, but previously had little empirical support for. And that's around the question of who are we including in our research studies and accounting for in our research studies, and therefore, uh, who have our research findings been applying to out in the real world? What we find is that as exciting as the research advances uh, may be, the suicide literature uh, infrequently accounts for certain groups of individuals who we know are at elevated risk of suicide, specifically LGBTQ populations. And we hope to continue doing this type of work to inform and improve both 
how we ourselves conduct research as well as our colleagues so that we can make sure that those who are most vulnerable and most affected by these clinical outcomes are accounted for and represented in these exciting and promising advances.